everybody, and welcome to the last episode of 2019 as voted by you guys. Before we start talking about the movie that won, let's talk about the movies that lost. Uh, Scott, you had The Rocketeer. Man. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, Scott. I love The Rocketeer. I wouldn't know what I would say about The Rocketeer. Oh, man. I think we would have had Megan on for that because she and I... Uh, many moons ago bonded over the fact that it awoke something in both of us the first time we watched it um <laughs> for her it was uh timothy dalton um picking out the white dress for um jennifer connelly and for me it was just jennifer connelly <laughs> <laughs> never seen it what yeah oh it's a fun one dude it may even be on disney plus i think it was a disney movie it's a disney movie and i'm sure it's on disney plus uh so i had picked Streets of Fire, which I still really think we could get a great episode out of, but it was a close one. Streets of Fire had a lot of people in its corner, but not nearly as much as Brian's pick with Crybaby. So, Brian, why did you pick Crybaby? Uh, because I just love the movie. I wanted to change a pace, you know. Um, and I was like, man, this movie is this movie is a lot of fun, and I love John Waters. And <laughs> no shit. It's not, Although it's not my favorite John Waters movie, it's the one I could go in most confident because it's something I'm. It's a sensitive subject for me, so like I was afraid to watch like Cecil be demented because like I wouldn't be able to agree to disagree if anyone didn't like that movie. But I'm I was fully confident that everyone would thoroughly enjoy Crybaby. <laughs> so yeah. uh, wait, wait. Why would do you think that Cecil be demented is, uh, would be a, a divisive pick? I just, that's one of those, so there's certain things where it's like, Cecil B. Demented is one of my favorite movies, and it's in the same playing field as Say Anything as being my favorite band, is like, I love them both so much, but like, it's hard for me to defend them if someone doesn't like them, so I just get angry. You know what you I mean? Because you take it personally, you're like, yeah. how could you possibly not love this thing that I love? Yeah, but I also deep down understand why people wouldn't love it. And I just don't know how to handle that. So I just get angry and deflect, deflect. <laughs> <laughs> so I I have watched Crybaby a couple times. I feel like it's the John Waters movie that I forget about the most. I think it's because I constantly am thinking that scenes that happen in this happen in Hairspray and vice versa. Mm. Um, Because they're very similar tonally and visually. During this watch, A, I realized that I don't give this movie enough credit. And B, I really think John Waters is probably my favorite director. Like, having sat down and watched it. Because he has such a distinct style. And while he does these really outrageous, weird, gross-out movies, he's actually very talented behind the camera while doing it. Versus, like, you know, I love Lloyd Kaufman. But Lloyd Kaufman, you would never say, is, like, a great dude behind the camera. (laughs) But, like, John Waters, like, knows how to really set up a shot. Mm-hmm. And it, it makes it so visually captivating to watch. So I've seen this movie so many times. And this watch was the first time that I realized that this is really a third act musical. Like, the first two acts aren't really a musical in the sense of, like, they're singing, but it, it always makes sense. Like, they're in a car listening to a song yeah. singing along. Or they're on stage singing. And, like, the rest of the movie is just a movie. And then once he goes to jail is when it actually becomes like a musical. That's not an unfair assertion. And here's a, here's one thing I want to, uh, maybe you talk some more and then I give you the hot take. Cause I love this movie. So there's, we're not going to argue about things, but I do want to talk about the third act. I will say, I want to say that I think that the opening scene is like the perfect combination of everything you ever need to know about what John Waters does. Well, (laughs) <laughs> like it's it's like a mundane everyday thing that is shot like a horror movie at times <laughs> but but in like the brightest lit colors with like the weirdest 50s rock behind it yeah man i love the fact one of my favorite things about him is like he just does what he wants to do you know it's not like you know he got a huge cult following with pink flamingos and it's not like oh i need to keep doing this he just makes a movie he wants to make and it's not even that he like grew up because a dirty shame is kind of like filthy, 
You know yeah. what I mean? So it's like not like, oh, I grew out of that. It's just like, I feel like making a, an upbeat movie. I feel like making a, this type of movie. Uh, I feel like making a filthy movie. You know, like I, I love how he just makes what he wants to make and doesn't like cater. And you can tell that he cares about his, his characters like mm-hmm. so much. He cares so much about his characters, even the villains. He really like makes them pop and distinct. Yeah. I was listening to his book. Um, what the hell was his most recent book? Mr. Know-it-all. And uh, he was saying like that poor girl that plays the main character just like did not fit in with anybody. And now when I watch it, I like feel for her. Like she was just the, she was the one that was so out of like, so out of place on set and behind the scenes because like, she takes acting very, very seriously. And I don't think she knew what she signed up for. Because like I said, it's not filthy, but it's still it's still John Waters. So it's still a very ridiculous movie. Well, and like my favorite story from the filming of Cry Baby is the Tracy Lord story where uh, the FBI visited the set because she was in the middle of her whole trial for the underage porn stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And she apparently was like devastated and crying and the whole cast and crew just sat down with her and shared all their stories about being arrested in the 70s and the <laughs> 80s to comfort her. And I think that's such like a that is a John Waters every cuz he's got like Patty Hearst is in this movie. Like, Wait, yeah. what did, what did Patty Hearst uh She was a cult. She was like Yeah, a she was cult in a child. cult. Yeah. What? Yeah. That's why like that's why her it's so funny because it's like her acting that you think is like a shtick. I'm sure that's just how she talks. Like if you think about it, she talks like such a cult person. <laughs> yeah. Well, so um Matt, we know what Brian's favorite John Waters movie is. What's yours? I think it's actually Hairspray. Okay. Can I can can I tell you a a dirty secret? Uh-huh. I prefer the remake. See, I I think for me, the biggest thing that hurts me with the remake is the casting of John Travolta. And I think it's just because... Oh, that was Divine in the original, right? That Mm -hmm. was Divine in the original. And when you look at who they wanted to originally cast, it was two people... Like, the two people that they wanted for the roles, but the studio said, no, you need a bigger name, I just think would have embodied more of what that character needed to be. Because the original people they were looking at were um nathan lane and um oh shit what is his name brian uh raspy voice the brother in uh mrs doubtfire i don't yeah. know and like the thing is the whole point of like the mother in hairspray was that it wasn't supposed to be a man pretending to be a woman you know what i mean like right divine isn't talking like a woman he's not really acting like a woman it just happens to be a man that's playing the role of a woman and I think that those two actors would have embodied that a lot more than John Travolta, who I feel like is really trying hard to like make you buy that he's a woman, and and something's lost in translation because of it for hmm, me. Fair enough. But the music's great. I think they should have went with Nathan Lane, but in the sense of getting a, a a bigger name, the fact that this show consists of three people that watch a lot of movies, and all three of us can't think of the one guy's name, <laughs> I can't yeah. I can't knock them for not wanting him on yeah. the bill. God, I'm going to I'm going to see his name and then I'm going to be so angry because I used to know his name. Uh, I never knew his name in the first place. That's why (laughs) he's just like, oh, that guy with the raspy voice. Yeah. Um, So uh, the reason I like the Hairspray remake so much literally is the music like it's Harvey Firestein. Harvey Firestein. That was it. Okay, Uh, sorry. I love how you're like, oh, yeah, of course. Harvey (laughs) fucking Firestein. How could I have been so stupid? I, I, I think for me, it's just because his name sounds like you can only say it the way that he sounds. Well, at least I, I know. Bobby Fye, Steve. <laughs> like, <it's laughs> like... I, I really want to like the original Hairspray more, but the music in the, in the, what was 2010 version or whatever it was? Yeah. Is just so good. And well, you get and fucking Ted Bundy. <laughs> is a whole t-shirt tv show host yeah i think the big difference for me is that like what i love about hairspray the original and what i love about cry baby and what i love about even like his earlier stuff like pink flamingos john waters has such an incredible seven inch collection of these obscure 50s like forgotten novelty songs mm-hmm. that he just loves to shove into those movies mm-hmm. so like 
the soundtrack to the original hairspray is just filled with the weirdest songs yeah and like i used to like for a long time i thought that they had made up all these songs for the movie and then you do research and it's like no the cockroach was an actual dance that they tried to make a thing like (laughs) like it's just like he just kept all those records and has that like iron he's got a memory for the 50s the way that i do with like 90s music where i remember (laughs) like i remember the failed follow-up singles to like the one hit wonders big songs because i was just so invested in the radio at that time and i think that's how he was in the 50s and that's why i love hairspray is such a love letter to that but and that's why i think this is such a great companion piece i'll just say that's going to be my double feature sorry but like (laughs) But it is oh, such I got a I got a good double piece. feature, so you you're not offending me with that. But, but, like, but Matt, real this, quick question. This movie, okay, go ahead. Uh, who sang Janie Says from the from the nineties? Jane Says. Janie Says turn off the radio. Oh, that was uh the cowboy mouth. Wow, okay. good job, man. I <laughs> that song comes to mind every once in a while, and I'm like, man, fuck I, that song. It was so terrible. Because well, there was. Because there's Jane Says, and then there's Jane Says by Jane's Addiction. Yeah. <laughs> Ugh, Jane God. Says. Man, the 90s were fucking stupid. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I will say there's two songs. Well, there's one song that this movie introduced me to that is still one of my favorite weird 50 songs. And that's Rubber Biscuit by The Chips, <laughs> which is like the strangest song. And it's when... um. Hatchet face is trying to break into the prison. It's like bow 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 bow. It's just and it's so my favorite thing about that song is that um when the Blues Brothers went on tour in the 70s, you know, the whole joke was that like Dan Aykroyd's character didn't really talk on stage. He would just play harmonica and like occasionally sing back up. And whenever they would do a live show, uh John Belushi would be like Hey, you know what? How about how about uh, Elwood comes up and sings a song for everybody, and everyone's like excited to hear him sing, and that's what he would cover every <laughs> single time. Was he just go? Um, and then the other thing is like the way that he makes a song that I love, like Shaboom, seems so lame and cheesy with the performance that they mm-hmm. give it. Is like I do my love that favorite. Shaboom version. Oh my god. Just the goofy smiles and the synchronized dance moves is fucking perfect. Man, and I love, and I think they're both originals. Um, Teenage Prayer, I think, is an original. And then I'm positive that Teardrops Are Falling is an original. But I, yeah. they're, they're my two favorite songs. Oh, see, my... My favorite, my favorite might actually be Please, Mr. Jailer. I love oh, that song. That, that is, that's, okay, this is a great lead in to what I wanted to talk about guys. So please don't be upset with me. I do love cry baby. And I don't know if I could, I don't know if I've seen enough John Waters movies to tell you what, what my favorite is, but I would probably say if, you know, gun to head, I would say, you know, cry baby because it's fifties. It's Johnny Depp It's Tracy Lords. So, um, <laughs> but covers all the, it's the Venn diagram of all Scott's interests. <laughs> well, Tracy Lords is so fucking hot in this movie. And, oh, she's, and Depp, she's so funny. She's oh, she's so funny. You know, I I love Tracy Lords for all of her faults. She's probably the most talented porn star turned actress I know of. Um, yeah. But she seems like she'd be wild at a convention. Oh like, man, it, like how, her like a pop rock and that's horror. That's exactly would what I was gonna say. So she'd be so fucking charming. I like I imagine that she would be like the same level as like a Felicia Rose. Like just so Can personable you imagine and like willing. The two of them <laughs> hanging out together, <laughs> the world would implode. Uh, anyway, what I want to say is that "Please, Mr. Jailer" is my favorite song in this movie. It's such a great scene, and Amy Locaine, although I she's not my type at all, really kills it and is gorgeous in that red dress. Yeah. She's not singing that though. That is no. sung by yeah. It's Rachel Sweet who yeah. sang the theme song for Hairspray. As yeah, well. yeah. Rachel Sweet did a bunch of stuff in this. She's the singing voice for all of Amy Locaine's parts. But in any case, uh, and we have to talk about Amy Locaine later. <laughs> but I, this movie really drags for me in the third act when it becomes a musical, which is really weird to say, and I'm so embarrassed of myself. No, to no, say it. no, no. I am actually going to slightly agree with you because. 
I love this movie. The first 45 minutes of this movie flies. Yeah. Like, it fucking flies. When I hit, like, the how much time was left and saw that I only had, like, 30 minutes left, I was blown away because I felt like I'd only sat down 15 minutes ago. But that last 30 minutes does really feel like feels longer than the lead up to it. I just don't weird. really like it that much. I like I like bits and pieces of it. Well, I, I really that- don't. I do not like the um, what's the song that they sing in the jail? Uh, like the the. Guess I'm doing time for being young. Yes, that one. Um, I love the dance and the visual of it, but that song is so boring to me. Yeah, I would say so. I had two notes related to you, Scott, when it came to songs. Question number one was when is Scott going to cover King Crybaby? <laughs> Never. I don't love that song. <laughs> it's uh, it's the saxophone. Yeah. <laughs> I, and question number- I Well, let me explain to you. I, I think I probably mentioned this to you at least once, but I don't know if Brian knows this, and I don't know if the listeners know this, but I played saxophone for like three years in junior high, and I now cannot stand the sound of saxophone. <laughs> I And here's the thing saxophone is becoming this thing where people are putting it into death metal and tech death songs. And I don't get it because (laughs) it is like the most obnoxious fucking instrument. I truly don't think that there's any other, any other brass instrument that grates on me like that. Like I can listen. Well, even any classical instrument, you find me a fucking woodwind that's as annoying as a saxophone. And I'll be like, no, I'll take it. I'll, 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 I'll take I'll take clarinet, and I don't even like clarinet. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a sax guy. Yeah. But uh, so so the other thing is Scott. You know, everyone here who listens to the show knows you, you used to have a '50s rock band called Survivor Girl, and I used to say the best thing about Survivor Girl was that in two e uh, in two LPs they covered every type of genre of '50s music and cliche imaginable. But then the teardrops were falling song happened, and I realized you missed. My absolute favorite 50s rock and roll cliche, which is the deep baritone voice speech in the middle of a slow song. <laughs> well, it's because I'm don't I'm not a bass. I'm a I'm a like a You could have brought in a I'm ringer, a baritone. Dude. <laughs> but no, that's man. like a that's like a 30 year thing. I think that's dude, like from the twenties to the Dude, 50s. I love it. It makes me laugh so hard. And I know Wait. that it's super sincere, but it makes my favorite one is if you listen to Who Put the Bop, which is still one of my favorite 50s rock songs, Who Put the Bop in the Bop, Shoo Bop, Shoo Bop. And there's one of those speeches in that song, too, <laughs> where it's like, baby, when you bop, shabop bop, shoo bop, it makes me, ho! Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Matt, I, I hate to tell you, but you're wrong. I did do that. If you oh, go really? back and listen to the Gets Out Alive EP that I did by myself, the very oh. first thing, the original version of Just the Two of Us, which was the first song I wrote as Survivor Girl, that, oh, I gotta go, I that gotta go back song to that EP actually that. at the end of the original version of Just the Two of Us, I do the talking <laughs> over the, the outro. <laughs> It's the best. When it happens in this movie where it's just the guy behind Johnny Depp, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I lose it. And that's so while we're talking about that scene, Allison drinking tears is the most unexplainably gross scene <laughs> that I've seen in a movie in a really long time. <laughs> I think it's because she's like straight up chugging it. But is it just me or like do you see these Johnny Depps like as his career is changing? Like Crybaby, perfect example. And just get really upset with the finished product. Yeah. You know, like I'm so, I'm so bummed out. And it's not like I hate him or he is a terrible actor by any means. It's just like, I wish that 2015 Johnny Depp and on never really happened. You know? Yeah. I, I think That's a big fair. thing of it for me, I think a big thing for me is that like the reason he took this movie was that he didn't want to ever be typecasted. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And it's like he did all these movies in like the nineties that were distinctly like him being a chameleon and, and becoming these new characters and, and what's then, eating yeah, Gilbert like couple, grape man yeah. straight up. Mm-hmm. Like that was, then, well, like, that was what? 93. Yeah. Like there was a long time where I didn't know what Johnny Depp's actual speaking voice. sounded like. <laughs> he had a different type of accent and everything, but like, yeah, I think just around like the pirates thing just became 
where it was like, or I could just keep doing this. Listen, you get that <laughs> Disney money, you get that fucking Disney money. That's, that's but true. But I got to give him props. Johnny Depp is probably one of my favorite actors. I hate to, I mean, as far as Hollywood acting goes, dude kills it in every single thing. Because the first time yeah. I saw Pirates of the Caribbean, I saw it in theaters. I don't know why. Well, I saw it multiple times in theaters. That, okay. that was like one of those movies I saw multiple times. You have the first to one's it, a great movie. Yeah, like first two are actually really fun adventure flicks. Like it's yeah. it's absurd to be like, oh yeah, they turned it, a fucking ride a, into a franchise. They turned a ride into a better Indiana Jones movie than the Indiana Jones movie we got. Like yeah, well we don't talk about. Well actually we're still waiting for the fourth Indiana Jones movie. That's true. So and maybe it, one day we'll get it. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> anyway. What I really want to say about Pirates of the Caribbean is that Jack Sparrow is a truly incredible performance. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. he, but the thing is, is that it's like, I don't know. I, I don't know what's coming to mind. Uh, kind of like. I'd say he's like our generation's version of um, Skarsgård's Pennywise. Like it's, it's well, a great transform. I, I, I don't, uh, uh, we're going to, I know we'll get into, we'll get into it, but like I, whether you like or hate the new, I, I love, movie, I love Skarsgård's, his, I prefer Skarsgård to, to Tim yeah. Curry personally, but, and, and, and I think that he made an icon instantaneously the same way that Jack Sparrow kind of became this instant icon. Right. But what you know I'm I mean? getting like, at though, and I, I, I think is really important for us to keep in mind as we are like, I wish the 2015 giant up didn't happen. That movie was that performance was so good that that's why it's annoying now yeah. because mm -hmm. pop culture just, you know, like they latched onto it. It's, I mean, I don't, I don't want to assume the worst, but I'm going to assume the worst about baby Yoda in the Mandalorian that it's, like fuck it's so good that it's so cute and everything that and i know it's not actually baby yoda i know it's called the child like shut the fuck up star wars nerds but but oh colloquial God, term yeah but that's the thing is that i am obsessed with baby yoda and i understand people being frustrated with that in pop culture because it's everywhere right now and that's i think what we need to keep in mind is with Jack Sparrow is that yeah. it was so good and everybody latched onto it that it became annoying. Yeah, no, but I think that's fair. Johnny Depp. Let's, let's just here, talk about his best. Thing. I need the I need the Johnny Depp that can scream. Electricity makes me insane. And <laughs> I wrote that down. Me. Oh man, <laughs> I'm burning inside to touch you, baby. Dude, the 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 Alphabet Bomber is my absolute favorite fake serial killer yes. of all oh, time. Oh man, <laughs> I would love him to explaining him, it, dude. It's like, Wait, the alphabet bomber. He set bombs in alphabetical order. <laughs> and I forget what his examples were, but it's so fucking funny. Yeah, I wish I had written down those examples too. But then he he's like, she's like, and your mom. He goes, she couldn't even spell, but they sent her to the electric chair. Too. <laughs> like Johnny Depp is giving one hundred and ten percent every single time he's on the screen, and it's <laughs> so well. He's doing Jailhouse Rock. Like I get it, and yeah. it's so. I mean, I've gotten it since. You know, the first time I saw this movie in high school, but man, I just, I cannot say enough good things about Johnny Depp as an actor. I, I was just, as I was watching this, I was thinking about all the other times I've loved watching Johnny Depp. I'm talking, you know, Ichabod Crane in Sleepy Hollow, obviously Glenn in Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, Ed Wood for me. Ed Wood is yeah, so, for sure. I want, for I sure. really... I feel like we need to do an episode on Ed Wood, like a legit I just, episode. On I, Ed, it, Ed Wood's one of those movies where it's like, I don't ever want to know the true story of the real Ed Wood. I want to just imagine that exactly how that movie tells it is 110% the type of person that he was. Don't tarnish Ed Wood at all for me. I just want to believe that he was happy-go-lucky and friendly and great. We but, can have I mean, that episode. Like, that's yeah. <laughs> nothing wrong with Ed Wood um, is, like, why I'm so hesitant to say, like, a movie has a perfect cast. Because Ed Wood, I think, is the true definition of, like, a perfect cast. You know what I mean? Like, everyone is playing the perfect character. And uh, I could talk for hours about that movie. So can we talk about my two favorite scenes in the movie? Um, one is the courthouse scene. Uh, <laughs> which, A, I had to double check the rating because I couldn't believe that a PG-13 movie had three fucks in it. Which it, only <laughs> had, it only had one, technically. They, well, they, blew, they bleep out the first two. 
Not in the version. I, I heard the word fuck all three times. Oh, for some reason when I was watching it, every time I oh, watched it. Maybe I have it, a director's cut, maybe. Yeah, because it was like, beep. And she's like, what does beep mean? And then she's like, your honor, can we get the fuck out of here? They only <laughs> say it once. Maybe that's why. Oh, well, then the other line that I love, because it's such a ridiculous line is, well, you done it. You put your mother in an iron lung. <laughs> Dude. So I love, as you know, I love John Waters, right? But I love him for his storytelling. I love his stories. I don't, most of the time our humor is not aligned. Like a lot of times his movies don't make me laugh when it's the comedy parts. But this movie I think is, aside from what I told you, the hairspray scene with John Waters as the psychiatrist makes me laugh. But other than that, <laughs> like this, there's just certain things that just hits my humor so much that's so simple. Like that scene, like when uh, Tracy Lord's dad pulls up on the bus. I don't know why I find it so funny. It's like, we can count out of, split, out of state license plates. I saw one today all the way from Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> I love that Tracy Lord's uh, parents are square. Well, Tracy Lord is, Lord's is trying so hard to not be a square. Um, mm -hmm. But also, I think that the the supporting cast member who deserves a big old shout out for stealing the entire movie is Tracy Lord's hair in every scene because yes. <laughs> holy shit. Uh, I, I have to give credit to the, the quote unquote villain of the movie because his big ass goofy smile when he's doing the bunny hop down the street, <laughs> is like, which is the other. So that's the big moment that I swear is in hairspray and it's not like every time I'm watching hairspray, I'm like, Oh man, here comes the bunny hop scene. And then like, <laughs> But uh, that scene's great. Um, I just had a thought. Let me. I'm going to pitch this live on the air, and then I'm probably still going to do it. So, <laughs> so <you> the, <laughs> that's whatever. The mother in the iron lung uh -huh. is played by Mink Stoll, mm -hmm. who is one of John Waters' oldest friends. Mm -hmm. In 2007, I got to interview Mink Stoll in her apartment. What? Uh, and I still and I still have that audio. Was that when you were it's, living in L.A.? No, that was she lives in Baltimore. Still. Oh, so I just drove down sick. to Baltimore. Um, I still have that audio. It was from like the second episode of the St. Mort show. No one listened to it. It's very amateurish, but I can still release that like 17 minute interview uh, on the feed if anybody is interested in hearing it. You're, so, you're doing that. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> so, I didn't even get to so, hear that. So I will say that one of the biggest issues and I did level it in recent history um, only one of the mics was working and I didn't realize it. Thankfully, the mic that was recording her was the one that was working. So I sound very distant while asking questions, but she's like super clear and pristine. Um, but yeah, that was one of the coolest days I've ever spent. Like I drove down there. I thought it was going to be like, show up, do the interview, leave. So like I show up, we do the interview. She had an album coming out. She put out an album of her doing like jazz standards. Hmm. And we just talked a little bit about that. She was in a horror film that my friend had directed. And uh, I started packing up my equipment. And she was just like, I'm going to put on some tea. Do you want any? And I was like, uh, OK. So, so like I pack up stuff. She makes me a cup of tea. And then she like sits down and pulls out photo albums and just starts showing me photographs of like the set of, of Hairspray and Pink Flamingos. And like we just sat and we talked about literature and like all it was it was such I ended up being there for like two hours. Awesome. Just hanging out with her. It was it was one of the coolest experiences of my life. Um, and it sucks because it's like one of the things where it's like, I'm glad that I had it. But it's like one of the things where it's like, man, retrospectively, I kind of wish that I had stayed more in touch with Mink because she was very, very cool. Her and her and John took acid recently. And it was, it was <laughs> yeah. really funny. It was a whole thing. Like it took like a month of planning because they're old, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's the thing. John Waters still lives in Baltimore. Like, you can just go to a bar in Baltimore and John Waters could just be sitting there. Like, I would love to talk to him. Do not he's tempt like us. I yeah. know. I well, would, like, uh, he's I, the number one person that, like, living, fan, like, hero of mine that I want to meet. Like, yeah. more than anybody. Because, like, obviously I can't meet Jim Henson. <laughs> like, can't meet Mr. Rogers. So, next You guys the got Ouija John boards. Waters. That's true. I did get a Ouija board for uh, Christmas. My friend gave me one. John Waters is... He, he described the exact type of fame that I would love to have, which is he's like, I am famous only to the people that I would want to recognize me, which is like perfect. He's like, I can go out and live a normal life. And the only people who are going to stop me are actual fans of mine. And people who hate me have no clue what I look like. So it's great. <laughs> but he like he was in a Lonely Island video. Like people know what you look like, John. 
He he said that more people stop him because of his Simpsons episode than anything else. They're like, weren't you on the Simpsons? <laughs> that's a really weird. That's very odd. <laughs> it's still one of the best episodes of the Simpsons too. It's when Homer has to deal with his homophobia. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, big boys, zap. <laughs> <laughs> There's one last thing that I have to cover. I'm sure you guys still have stuff. But we got to talk about the incredible but super short Willem Dafoe cameo in this yeah. movie. Yes. Yeah. God, <laughs> just kind Willem of Dafoe. just storming into the scene, just yelling, you know, God bless. Dwight Eisenhower. <laughs> <laughs> like, just, we going to cut off your pretty little hair, boy. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of like... The one scene I like towards the end and around that is because it's so out of place with the movie is when he's trying to escape and he ends up in the barbershop and then it just cuts <laughs> to the mouse laughing at him too. <laughs> oh, this man. movie is very, I need to watch this movie. Like this was one of those movies. This happens every once in a while where like we watch a movie for the show and there's part of me that's like not even sure if I want to put the DVD back on the DVD shelf because I feel like I'll probably want to put it on in like a couple weeks. Mm-hmm. And like this one is definitely one where I'm like, I need to revisit Crybaby a lot more than I've revisited because this is probably the first time I've watched it in like a decade. Yeah, like, it's sat and collected dust for a while for me. Yeah, it's really it's one of those. It's like one of my ten video editing movies where like yeah, you know when I'm rendering something, I'll catch yeah, like just throw it on in the five background, minutes, yeah. you know. But most of the movie I don't hear because I have my headphones in. But yeah, I love it. But you hear, please, Mr. Jailer. Please, Mr. Jailer. <laughs> um, oh, it's so catchy. And I think I might make Jade watch it because she doesn't like musicals. And since this is a third act. Dude, that is a fucking fun. deal breaker. I yeah, know. You could trick her. I know. <laughs> I don't, how did you guys get to the in, the engagement portion if she doesn't like musicals? So our... So oh, our it's, very... it's because she's beautiful and she puts yeah. up with you. I got it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she's got to she's got to make more sacrifices, but it works out because <laughs> a couple that we're friends with the the wife is into musicals, so we already decided we're like, all right, we'll go see musicals if it comes, you know, to be because her husband doesn't like them, Jade doesn't like them, but there's no musicals coming out right now. You guys are missing a really important joke that I feel like I, I don't know how I feel about Brian not loving it, but. The hysterectomy pants, I call them. Oh, that is- so I, I was actually going to say, this is why I should take notes. There's so many things for everybody that is in an average or less than average death metal band. This movie has so many opportunities for you to have intros to your yeah. albums and songs. Yeah, I, I, I need to I need to get Ichabod Crane back in action and take all these fucking let Jesus Christ be your gang leader. Yeah. Like that, the, the, the covered in tattoos and tight pants, and then just my son wearing uh, wearing clothing, clearly decide by homosexuals. Like, I just think that's such a great... <laughs> oh, man, so fucking good. And um, uh, want to see these gunboats? <laughs> oh, my God. This movie just, it's so quotable. It is. Don't you got tits? Stick them out for Christ's sake. <laughs> oh, man. And and I – so oh, have I told you guys how old I was when I had my first kiss? No. I think high school, right? Sophomore. Yeah. I no, no. No. I was a fucking junior. Gotcha. I gotcha. was 17 years old. <laughs> <laughs> So I had my first kiss and and thankfully I hadn't I don't think I learned how to French kiss from Crybaby. <laughs> Cause that French kissing scene is absurd. Yeah. Oh my god. But I love it because everybody's like, no, no, no. But I did not I think this is my third time seeing this movie. I, I don't watch it very often. This is the first time I realized that Uncle Belvedere, one, is Iggy Pop, and mm-hmm. two, is Uncle Dad Belvedere. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I assumed that there was some sort of, you know, uh, incest or, or, you know, like, inbreeding of some sort because the in the uh the redneck Riviera, but that joke went so over my head until I was, like, Oh, and 
I felt so fucking stupid. Well, I've seen that movie a hundred times, and you actually just pointed that out, and okay. I never noticed it. So, well, I feel better now. But actually, you reminded me of something. I know Matt said the thing that disgusted him the most about this movie was uh, her drinking the tears. Yeah, I don't know what it is, but it's like nails on a chalkboard, uh, lipstick on your teeth, and the <laughs> fact that his aunt like just has it on the whole time. Her, yeah, it just bothers wait. No, that's me. his mom. I oh no, no, it is no, his aunt. Yeah. yeah. So maybe the joke, maybe the joke is an incest. I can't, I can't tell. So we're going to head on into the double features section. And Brian, since this was your pick, I mean, it was the movie that you picked and then the group voted on. What Mm -hmm. is your double feature? Um, I think that if I was genuinely, I know this is a cheap thing and I already know Matt, so I don't want to take his, but if I were to double feature this movie, I feel like it would be a, um, it would be a John Waters night, so I would probably do Serial Mom. Um, I have because, never seen it. It's good. You would like it. You would like it. Um, Desperate That's Living. Kathleen has, Turner. Yeah, yeah. Desperate Living has more of like the uh, the the fifty or or polyester. I'm sorry, polyester has more of like the the same feel as Crybaby, as far as like you know, just in my opinion, it does. Uh, but I think that. Serial Mom is on the same level as Cry Baby that, like, this is a movie that could be shown to the masses. Uh, it's not more of, like, a very acquired taste like a lot of his movies. Oh, yeah. I think that Cry Baby is probably his most accessible. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Now, I, I only saw Cecil be demented one time, and I think a lot of it went over my head. I also didn't realize it was a John Waters flick when I watched it. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you love so much about it? Because I, I barely it, remember half of it. So I think it just came at a perfect time in my life. You know, it came when I was going through this renaissance, we'll say. So so throughout high school, I became this guy that was very like, um, if anything was mainstream, uh, I hated it. Oh, and yeah. I would always have to have something that was an underground similar to compare like, oh, that's just a dumb version of blah. You know what I mean? Like just mm-hmm. because I not a lot of people liked me and I needed to a feeling of, you know, self aggrandizing feeling. Right. Sure. Um, and just as I started growing out of that, I come across this movie that, in my opinion, is m- virtually mocking that, you know, like mocking that like love for like mainstream cinema is awful is evil and and like you have to be like an independent filmmaker and blah 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 and it's just so the story is just so captivating you know it it's almost like john waters made a trauma film like it's the most that's that's it really does feel like that that's i always think that if when we eventually do terror terror firmer we can't we have to do like a ban on anybody double featuring it with with Cecil B. Demented because I have never finished Terror Firmer because I've been waiting for us to do it. Uh, So 2020, you know, probably one of you fuckers should pick it. Yeah. Uh, But that would be, I would probably watch both just so that I could, you know, so that the three of us could talk about both of them. But we would also have to be like, none of us can pick Terror for, or uh, Cecil B. Demented. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so the cast pro- is, is really funny. Like, if you think about the fact that, like, uh, Adrian Greenier, however you pronounce his last name, and Michael Shannon, that not only are they in this movie, but the roles that they play in this movie are just so funny. Especially Michael Shannon, because he is, like, a very serious actor now. Yeah. You know? Well, that was, like, half the cast is, like, before they were famous people. Uh Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Like, Alicia White is in there. Um, Maggie Gyllenhaal is in there. Alicia Witt? Witt, yeah, Yeah. sorry. Sorry, I I wasn't, I didn't want to make you sound stupid. I was just confirming. Yep, no. um, And fun fact, uh, I forget where I read this, but at one point, Troma was willing to finance uh, a Pink Flamingos 2 um, but what? John Waters opted not to do it, A, because he thought that Troma's editing software was the most outdated and <laughs> shitty equipment he's ever seen, and then, like, Divine died shortly after that. So he's like, ah, never mind. Yeah, and Divine's last film was uh, Into the Dark. Sure. Yeah. yeah true. Also picked by story. Brian. And uh, I watched a documentary about her, and it is so sad. I had no yeah. idea that she was, uh, what was the show, uh, Married with Children? Was that who she was yeah. supposed to play? Like, it was her big break. 
and she died the night before her first day of shooting. What? Yeah. Yeah. yeah Divine was gonna. She was gonna be Peggy, right? She was gonna be an. No, no. She was. She was playing. Uh, Divine was playing himself, like as a. Oh. So he was playing like the uncle or something. It was gotcha. a non drag role. Yeah, that that sucks. Divine is like Divine is super funny though. Mm-hmm. That's the other thing. Like I I used to not like the movie Female Trouble that much. That was like one of my le- least favorite John Waters movies. But like rewatching that movie, like Divine's over the top bratty shittiness in that movie is is really funny. Like her running around screaming about her cha cha heels. <laughs> <laughs> Those aren't the cha cha heels I requested. <laughs> Like, but like i think that's what like john waters always says like the charm with divine never got enough credit for like divine could play a bitchy woman and you would hate her so much and he could play the most loving mother you could possibly imagine in hairspray and you bought both of them and it was a man playing both of those roles. Mm-hmm. Like he was just like the, and also like what Divine did for drag is like so it was like it was, changed drag. Was Divine? I don't know enough about Divine. Div, was Divine a gay man that did drag, or was he? Yeah. W- w- so his he is the right pronoun, right? Yeah, he yeah. is the correct pronoun. Okay. Yeah. So Divine, the thing with Divine, and I've I've heard a couple people say this before too, but they talk about it in the documentary that Brian watched a lot is that. At the time in the 70s, drag queens were all about as much as you can make it look like a woman. Like, almost like, can you trick somebody? Okay. And Divine was this person who was just like, well, fuck that. I want to look outrageous. So, like, modern drag that you see today where it's that really outlandish Mm -hmm. style all stems from Divine. Okay, because that that makes so much sense because I... You know, I, I don't know what I saw recently. I mean, I haven't watched any like RuPaul lately, but I I saw some. Yeah, you know, I get a lot of ads on social for drag stuff, <laughs> I, and I have no problem with that. But so much of it, I'm I'm seeing re- now is just like, oh my god, they all look like the pictures of Divine that I've seen, um, and that makes total sense that he was kind of the the pioneer of that style yeah he was so yeah. endearing so when they did uh when they did polyester um tab hunter was one of the stars and he was like a heartthrob oh and dude that's did when we did into the dark that's why tab hunter was in it so did we yeah, discussed so that thing yeah. so john was like uh just so you know the the, the woman that you're going to be kissing is a man he was like oh okay you know like pretty laid back well, tab was it. in and love with Anthony Perkins. Yeah, and uh, they uh, they became such good friends. Such that makes so friends. much sense. Yeah. Why, Matt? Did you figure that out when we did Into the Dark? I don't think so. I know okay. I didn't because I watched this documentary post Into the Dark, so this is all fairly new knowledge. This is shortly after I watched Into the Dark. I I watched the documentary, but yeah, there was like a failed Western movie that Tab Hunter and Divine was in. Um, that was supposed to be cast to two women, um, which is like, I think that's what Matt's saying is like really paved the way. Like there's a lot of things like, and don't get me wrong. Like Hollywood is awesome now or getting better now where it's like, okay, we're going to, you know, we're going to cast the transgendered person for this role. But a lot of like roles back then were like that John Waters didn't do were intended for a woman. And like with that Western one, like Tab Hunter was like, no, this is the guy who's going to play one of them. <laughs> I can't remember the name of the movie. Yeah. But it was a flop. Um, so we are running very long. Well, I haven't done great. my double feature. And oh, yeah. So, Scott, let's do your double feature. Uh, well, Mine was hairspray. We'll just get that out of the way. Go, yeah. Scott. Yeah, yeah. You already said yours. And um, I <laughs> – it's strictly because Tracy Lords is awesome. I would pair this with Not of This Earth. Okay. Which was, I believe – a Jim Wynorski flick. I don't know if it was her first movie, but I'm pretty sure Jim Wynorski uh, directed that, might have written it. It's a remake, I think. But I also know that Chuck Serino did the music for it, and he's the guy that did the music for like a fuck ton of Jim Wynorski's movies, including Chopping Mall. Mm. And it's a really fun uh, score. I actually know, I know the score better than the, the movie itself. I watched it one time maybe seven years ago and I was barely paying attention, but I would love to revisit it. I don't know if it's, it's very campy, but I just don't know if it's a good fit for horror movie night. 
Yeah, she, this was yeah. Not of this earth was her first film since leaving porn. Okay, very cool. You know what her first film was after Crybaby though? Hmm. Motherfucking shock him dead. Oh man, we have we have to watch that at some point. I didn't know that Tracy Lawrence was in that. I forgot that she was in Bleed. Oh no, that's <laughs> that's so funny. When I was talking about Crybaby to Megan after watching it, I was like, hey. Um, have I ever told you that Tracy Lords was in um, Blade? And she's like, first of all, who's Tracy Lords? <laughs> and I was like, oh, she she did a bunch of underage or she did some underage porn in the uh, mid to late 80s. Uh, she was 16 or was she 16? She was 16, 16 or 17. Yeah. yeah um, but it was her fault because it wasn't like they. Yeah, she made a fake ID. To, she made a fake ID work. to do porn. But. Meg, but then I was like, "Oh, do you remember that woman in bl- the beginning of Blade who takes that dude to the the blood rave?" And she was like, "Oh yeah," and I'm like, "That's that's Tracy Lords." <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's do. I, I know we didn't talk about this ahead of time, but since we're running a little long and it is the last one of the year, do we want to instead of what do we watch this week? Just want to each say what our favorite film of the year was. Uh, it can either be like a film that came out this year or your favorite movie that we discussed this year that you had never seen prior. Well, here, I'm going to interject real quick. Since we're going to do our best of 2019 year-end wrap-up, yeah. why don't we just say our favorite episode or our favorite movie that we've discussed on, like that we did an episode of this year? Is okay. that okay that instead? That works for me. Let's do that. Fuck, now I got to um, go to our – I have to go to hmnpodcast.com yeah, and, and while, then while go to episodes. Looking, while Scott's doing all that – uh just a heads up guys new thing that i want to try uh just based on some advice that i got was you know we always say rate and review and and subscribe but we never really give you any incentive to doing that so here's the deal if you go and give us a five-star review we're gonna read it on the air so so flex your comedy styles to the best of your abilities and write us some really fun five-star reviews and we'll read them at the end of of episodes so uh, that's that's your mission. I'm sending that out there. You probably won't hear them read until closer to to February or March, based on the way that we record things. But that's that's your challenge for 2020 is get us some really solid five star reviews. Because apparently, the more of those that we have, the higher up we're ranked on iTunes and all the different categories, and it just helps the show get into more people's ears. You guys have been great this year. Thank you so much. It's definitely been my favorite year of us doing horror movie night in the the five years that we've been doing it which is insane that those words came out of my mouth uh, did you guys uh, figure out your movie yet yeah i figured out both because i don't know what the question is is it our favorite movie that we watched for this episode that, that we saw for the first time this year on the episode or our favorite episode that we recorded like the most fun recording i mean i'll let you do both because i'm curious yeah. what you had the most fun recording honestly yeah. Out of the Dark, easily the favorite movie I came across this year. And I think, dude, I think Phantom of the Opera was, like, the most fun. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, I loved that Phantom episode. It's not the funniest you've ever been, but because, like, I think that you have some fucking zingers. Uh, actually, in, was it Psycho 4? The, the, the bees? <laughs> what? <laughs> that might be my favorite Matt or uh, Brian quote of the year. But I got to say that Out of the Dark might be the best. It's it's actually a toss-up for me. It's 50-50. Um, Out of the Dark is probably the best movie that we found out about this year. But Children of the Corn, Urban Harvest is a close, close second. Because yeah. that one blew me away. I did not expect it to be quite so entertaining, gory, and really shocking. That mom's death is it's still burnt into my brain. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to I'm just going to jump right off of that and say pretty much exactly the same as, as... Ah, it's got to be out of the dark. Um, that that movie. I mean, that was like the home run for Brian. I think he he found that shit and it changed changed everything. I think the most fun I had, though, when it came to like the combination of recording, like watching and then recording an episode I had so much fun with The Last Shark. Like, The Last Shark was just such oh, a Oh, man, The Last movie. Shark. 
Like, it was such a weirdly bad movie, and we had so much, like, there's so many points in that episode where we just mention a moment that happens in the movie with no joke, and I'll start laughing. Because <laughs> it is, like, without a doubt, the most bad one that we've seen in a while. Dude, I think yeah. that The Last Shark might be our best episode. I need to re-listen to that <laughs> one and Family Opera, but I also feel like we had some real bangers in Amityville. It's about time. Man, that was a funny fucking episode. Yeah, I'm trying to. Man, we watched some bad movies this year. <laughs> well, and and let's let's just put 2019 to fucking bed. I don't ever want to be drunk on the air again. Was that yeah. oh, subspecies dude. or nocturna? Whichever one yeah, it was, kind of I was so. <laughs> it was both. <laughs> I was mad that that so much was cut, but I love chaos. And it was a lot of fun. I like thought that it, the whole thing was hilarious. But Man, you would have definitely just... killed my brother. <laughs> <laughs> no, I probably would have killed myself for being a dumbass who got drunk on air. Yeah. To oh, my well. credit, we were at Monster Mania. And yeah, it wasn't like you just woke up at nine in the morning and like, started. Let's get them. fucked up. Yeah. No. Like it, was, like it was after a very long day at a convention with uh, a very – a couple bad influences, honestly. I, was, I put most of the blame on Zach, but Kyle kept pouring you some shots. Too. No, I was pouring it for Kyle. Oh shit! Right. Okay, and Kyle yeah, fell asleep when we were well, Dude, whatever that episode. Was the best. Oh that my was god! The best. And then he woke Kyle up. Kyle fell asleep at you screaming, which is so, that's the part that no one will ever hear. But yeah, you, <laughs> I fucking love you it. had. Kyle. You had like a mental breakdown in the middle of recording and Kyle just woke up with the biggest smile. <laughs> um, all right, guys. Well, it's been a great year. We are going to do uh, an end of the year recap on probably New Year's Eve. That'll be up wait, waiting for you. And then we're going to dive in to 2020. And I got to say, looking at, I mean, we're starting rough. Uh, we are. No, we're, we we're going to kill rough. it, man. It's going to be so much fun. No, no, no don't listen. <laughs> the first episode of 2020 is rough. Wait, but let me then, see. Let me see. But once we get past that, oh, you're right. Oh, it's, fucking Brian, it's fucking home runs me... for the for the next like four months. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited. I don't even know what it is. <laughs> Watch it be not nearly as bad as we're expecting it to be. Uh, Scott, I didn't send you this video, but someone posted a YouTube video that I watched out of curiosity called "The Ten Worst Slasher Movies of All Time," and their icon was the cover of that movie. Fuck. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> like, all right, what are we recording? Ba, ba, ba. Huh? Okay. Oh! <laughs> yes, dude. And it's the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you for listening. We'll be back in a, just a week with some more lovely, lovely jokes and, and stories for your ear holes. Peace. listening to the Geekscape Network.